Welcome everyone to the UK Startup Conference 2022. It's a pleasure to see you all here. Uh, my name is Adam. Uh, I'm the founder of Startup Network Europe and uh, we make online conferences for European startups. Uh, we started one year ago uh, with the Irish Startup Conference 2021. I'm in Dublin at the moment and since then we've done seven more. Uh, and obviously today we're doing the UK Startup Conference 2022, and we have a lot more conferences coming up across Europe. Um, so we have a dream to make a European startup community. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. It's going to be an online forum with lots of resources, uh, lots of VCs and investors, um, and it will be on Discord. Um, but for now, uh, our plan for today is very simple. It's a two hour event with uh, 28 different speakers. And that includes UK Startup Association leaders, VCs and angel investors, uh, founders and CXOs. Not just in the UK, but also uh, British startups that have gone to the United States as well. Now, our sponsors for today, uh, have to mention them because they make the conference possible. Uh, Personio is the first one. Uh, they are a HR software for startups and SMEs, which uh, helps improve operational excellence to pave the way for strategic work to shine. Uh, this means accelerating daily work, reducing administrative chaos, and ensuring that every core HR process works like a dream. Uh, Amplitude is the second sponsor. Uh, they are the digital optimization system uh, with their trademark behavioral graph uh, innovation. They sort through millions of seemingly random actions to instantly find patterns of customer behavior and predict outcomes and adapt experiences. Uh, and actually attendees of this conference uh, can apply to get Amplitude for free for one year. I'll share a link for that. Uh, then we have Twilio, uh, which is a cloud communications platform used by millions of startups and um, developers can use uh, Twilio web service APIs to make and receive phone calls, text messages and other communications. And uh, they also have a free credits and resources program, which we can share during the conference. And finally, Startups Magazine is a UK magazine, uh, bi-monthly print and digital publication. And uh, their following includes startups, engineers, investors, growth hackers, accelerators, marketing wizards, really everyone in the startup world in the UK is, uh, is following this in some way. Uh, so very quick introduction, we have lots of people outside of the UK. So you may know it's, it's a country in Europe with 67 million people, uh, the fifth biggest economy in the world. Uh, in terms of startups, um, there are hundreds of thousands of startups, uh, millions even, um, but in terms of dealroom.co, uh, they have identified 38,000 verified startups, and the growth is quite incredible in terms of funding alone. Uh, you can see here in, uh, in 2010, there was a tiny amount of funding, and just uh, 10 years later, 11 years later, um, the funding was 40 billion. And already in the year to date, uh, it's over 12 or 13 billion. So it's huge, huge growth in terms of uh, funding, employees, numbers of startups in the UK, which is really good to see. And uh, following today's uh, two hours, um, on Thursday, May 5th, uh, we will host the London Startup Meetup 2022. So this is going to be uh, a free event uh, with about 200 people. That's the capacity that we have. So uh, I'll share the link to sign up for that. Um, and on the morning of Thursday, May 5th, we're also doing a London CXO breakfast uh, sponsored by Twilio, uh, both of these events. And um, that's designed for CXOs of companies uh, with about 5,200 employees. It's a breakfast, very exclusive, and uh, it's going to be um, a great value, I think. And finally, uh, Twitter, uh, yesterday, uh, today is uh, being sold to Elon Musk. And uh, we've decided to use uh, Twitter for the first time as a result. So the hashtag is UK Startups 2022. And uh, it would be great to see your tweets. We'll, we'll try to respond to you during the conference. Uh, now, all of this conference today is live, except for the first session, which is a pre-recorded session. Um, it's one of my favorites. Uh, we have Stephen Kelly, uh, Chairperson of Tech Nation, Anita Patel, CBE, CEO of the Center for Entrepreneurs, and uh, Jenny Tooth OBE, uh, Executive Chair of the UK Business Angels Association. So I'm going to share a video now, and I hope you all enjoy it. So Stephen, uh, we'll begin with you. Why is the UK a good country to set up a startup in? 
I think it's uh, amazing that we what half a million startups every year in the UK, and we certainly get it in the DNA around entrepreneurship. There's probably three factors that really play strongly to that. It's the environment, uh, particularly the tax treatment for early stage companies with EIS, SCIS, if you're a tech company around R&D tax credits. So it's a very benign, very supportive environment uh, right from the get-go. And then secondly, I think now there's a wealth of um, talent and skills and recycle capital in terms of mentors, coaches, a brilliant angel network out there right across the country from Belfast to Aberdeen down to Bristol and of course London. Uh, and the third factor is uh, a record year last year in 2021 for VC investment venture capital of $30 billion, uh, which kind of outstrips anywhere else in Europe or anywhere else in the world apart from the US and China. So I think we've really created this super highway for startups and that's very much part of our DNA in the UK. Thank you, Stephen. And Anita, I will put that question on to you. Thank you. Um, just just uh, um, adding to Stephen's three points. Um, and the one thing that we, we in the UK tend to take for granted, you know, we have a rule of law in this country. We have good justice systems. We have good institutions, regulate, a regulatory framework around data, privacy, and so on. And that is important uh, for people starting businesses. Um, uh, also, adding to something Stephen said, you know, it's fairly easy to, to register and start a business from a regulatory point of view. It's relatively easy to um, get a bank account. Uh, some, would, some would disagree with that. Um, and, um, and the third thing I, I, I would say is the openness of the people in this country um, for people and ideas from elsewhere. We're, we're a, a very mixed um, uh, open country for welcoming people from elsewhere. Thank you, Nita. And Jenny, I'll put that on to you. Thank you. Um, just, just adding to all of that, I mean, from my point of view, I think we have the most connected and vibrant uh, supply chain of investment. And it's not just for your life as a startup, it's when you grow to be an effective scale up. So we are able to link right across that supply chain, the investment community who work really closely together. And I think it's a unique feature here in the UK. So we have really strong ecosystem that supports and wraps around startups right through to scale ups. And it's not just in London as a capital city, um, Cambridge, Oxford, but right across the UK, you know, we are building vibrant regions and vibrant communities for startups. Um, I think finally a really important thing to bear in mind is we are really supportive of diversity here in the UK and we're really growing our community to focus on both women as founders and founders from all kinds of underrepresented groups here across the UK and building some amazing companies um, through the dynamic of, of diversity and, and all of those great ideas. So I would say that that's a, a, you know, a kind of opportunity for you to consider our welcoming and vibrant opportunities here in the UK. Thank you, Jenny. And I'll expand on that a little with a new question for everyone. Uh, what sectors are thriving in the UK right now? Can you mention any success stories? So, yeah, it's it's a really exciting time. And I think, you know, we've got after the pandemic here in the UK, we've seen the emergence of some amazing companies who've really embraced some exciting areas of, of technology and opportunity. Um, for me, the real opportunities have really been growing in, in sustainability and climate change. Um, and, and, and clean tech. Um, a great example of that actually is, is Cambridge GAN devices. And I would, I would say that not only because it's run by an amazing woman founder, but really using kind of fabulous semi semiconductors and deep tech to bring great business to market, which has shown huge commercial value. Most importantly, was a great startup backed by angels here in the UK. And then probably my second one there would be Marshmallow, because again, reflecting that amazing support, not only of women founders, but of, of, of black founders here in the UK. And they were the first UK black unicorn uh, in, in InsurTech, which is a really, really important area as well, emerging in the UK, both using technology to drive through fantastic companies. Great, thank you, Jenny. Anita, any sectors that you're excited about right now? 
Yes, indeed. I mean, the, the broad, broader technology sector, you know, around cybersecurity, uh, the fintech payments, uh, and, 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 and so on. Um, what I'm seeing from where I sit in within the Center for Entrepreneurs is um, very, very early stage companies building communities. And I think this might be a re might be a kind of uh, um, a post pandemic kind of desire. So uh, networks that connect people with, who have diff who have the same um, uh, interests, uh, you know, I, I want to want to do something together. Um, one of the ones that has come out of uh, our, our program is a BYP network, which is Black Young Professionals Network, uh, founded by a wonderful woman called Kike Aniwinde. Um, I'm seeing a lot of technology around uh, education and learning for younger people, for people in schools. One I'm uh, helping out at the moment is um, one, another female founder called Zara Ransley, uh, who's, who's started mypocketskills.com. Uh, um, and also, as, as Jenny has said, um, almost everyone we work with who in their early mid twenties have see life through a prism of climate collaboration and carbon. Um, so I think in the, in the future, we're going to see some tremendous uh, startups and scaling companies in those three sectors. Thank you, Nita. And Stephen, I will give that question to you. I, I totally agree. And I think in terms of the vertical markets, obviously the UK is head and shoulders above anywhere else in the world, apart from the US in terms of fintech. And that's because of the financial services history, I guess, of the city of London as a, a key kind of springboard. Uh, and Jenny highlighted insurance tech as a key part of that as well. Uh, and then the UK has got massive natural advantages through language law and all these sort of areas. Uh, and it, that permeates uh, edutech, uh, health tech as well with the power of the NHS and the innovation happening right across the UK in terms of healthcare and the brilliant university system here. I think four of the top 10 universities in the world are located in the UK. Um, and the other kind of area is, is law tech, actually. 40% of the world's laws across all the countries uh, have their genesis from the UK. So we've got some unfair advantages in those markets. And like um, Nita and Jenny say, in terms of AI, cyber, again, because the university is the brilliant academia and innovation that's happening, and also around the whole net zero sustainability areas, it's fundamental. And I, I'm involved in a couple of companies as a chair and director and angel investor. One, uh, the algorithm people, which is really excited leading the decarbonization of large fleet management uh, organizations and vehicles uh, across the UK and around the world. Uh, and also in health tech, uh, Locum's Nest, which is started by two doctors, uh, who kind of jumped into the world of technology to liberate healthcare professionals and give uh, really kind of fix the issues around resource and workforce management in the NHS. So very exciting times, I think, for the UK. And I, I think Nita and uh, Jenny not only talk about the, the sectors that are thriving, but we're doing it the right way with a lot of diversity embedded from the get go to make it very inclusive. Thank you, Stephen. And how can the UK startup ecosystem improve, in your opinion? There's a very uh, interesting article in The Economist this week about um, uh, startup clusters around the world and how some have, have really grown and some have floundered. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a theme that runs through the successful ones and that Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv, Singapore, uh, London to a lesser extent, is that they all started with a, a significant amount of government support. And um, I, I sense that for, for London to continue, not just London, but the UK, you know, as Jenny, Jenny's quite right, it's not, it isn't just a London-centric startup ecosystem. Um, we are going to need government support um, in, 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 in forms of grants, in forms of um, funding, in forms of, um, you know, government as a, as a, as a client, as a customer. Um, the, the second thing where I see is the access increasingly will need more access to funding for the really early, early stage startups. The ones that I work with are trying to raise their first 100,000 to the first million. And I think we could do better, um, although, of course, um, UK Business Angels and other networks do uh, offer that uh, very well. Um, those are the two that immediately come to mind for me. Thank you, Nida. And Jenny, um, how can the ecosystem improve? 
Yeah, I mean, following on from that, I mean, and Anita touched on, you know, on funding, you know, it's, there are always gaps in the whole funding ecosystem and that very, very early stage has probably suffered a little bit by the fact that we've had such a successful venture um, community now, um, and obviously they're doing bigger and bigger deals. So those earlier deals, you know, there is still often a lack of seed fund here that we're really working on and bringing many more angels into this space. We need, we need more and more great people, particularly successful entrepreneurs, um, to come in and start backing the next stage of, of early entrepreneurs. So that's always going to be a challenge for us. I think um, Stephen touched on universities, and for me, they have huge potential, which we have really not fully exploited yet here in the UK. So we have huge centers of innovation, opportunity, um, great new ideas coming through. And I think making sure we can hub their, their all that they have to offer to build more successful um, clusters of startups and, and investment around them is something we still really need to, to work on a bit. And then finally, just in that final stage, when you've built your business to huge growth, we still have a challenge in making sure we can give you all that funding you need when you really successful build that high growth stage and keeping you here in the UK to make sure you don't um, need to um, fly off to the US, US to find that final capital. And we need to work on our pension funds and our institutional capital to make sure we can really grow all of that investment we need from startup through, through to that high growth phase. Thank you, Jenny and Stephen. I guess if I had a magic wand, we'd probably want to race the Victorian education system we predominantly have in the UK into the 21st century. And it wouldn't be fantastic if we taught kids entrepreneurship skills and even coding skills so that they're really fit for purpose to come into the economy and be really purposeful individuals building companies growing successfully uh, in the UK and overseas. I think there's three barriers that, that really hit companies as they scale up uh, and they're the same, but particularly exacerbated outside London. So firstly, the access to capital uh, is tougher if you're a person of color, if you're a woman outside London, we can do a lot more in terms of the regions and the regional support and diversity to make sure it's a much more equal world in terms of access to capital. Secondly, uh, honestly, we're not brilliant at taking fantastic companies overseas and planting the flag in the US and Asia and Africa and becoming global, genuine global market leaders. Uh, the Americans have done a much better job of that in the technology uh, field. Uh, and I think, again, we could help companies a lot more in terms of exporting um, products and services internationally to really become global market leaders. And the third one is uh, as companies grow, they hit barriers and need to raise the bar in terms of leadership team. And to Jenny's point, it's very much worthwhile helping them with the leadership development of the executive team to allow them to scale. And as they hit 50 million or 100 million or 500 million to smash through those barriers and really accelerate their journey to become global market leaders. And I think we can do a lot more around coaching, mentoring and recycling that talent of the last generation of leaders to be on the, on the pitch for today's leaders to really uh, grow their companies and become global market leaders. Okay, Stephen, Nita, Jenny, thank you so much. Excellent points made. Yeah, Valeria, your question is, what is the most interesting challenge that your startup has overcome? I think that the most exciting, especially for me, it is for sure like to manage the priorities because to be honest, as soon as you start receiving like the first clients and believe me, all of them, they start also uh, comment you and tell you it will be great if you can add such functionality or such product and you are for sure as you're always passionate about your clients you try to do a lot of things but after that you understand that look maybe you don't need to do so many things and where you need to also to stop doing but to really like to focus on uh, a key things and i think that for startup companies it is especially very important uh, to find the way how you will put the priorities for your team uh, especially for products and because you will always have uh, the task related to clients but also a lot of tasks related to your team and uh, every time you just need to think about and to remember that first of all all the 
uh, all the things which you will do, it should be scalable. It means that all the uh, features or any product, it will be good if you, it, it, it can be used not just by one client, but for sure, if it could be used by more clients and if the functionality which you are going to develop or you can do, uh, generally it will really help your team to cut some also like cost or to improve uh, some things to make it much more faster. Okay, Valeria, thank you. Very, very quick. Um, good points. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Rajib Day, MBA, uh, MBE, uh, founder and CEO of Learnerbly. Uh, what is the most interesting challenge that your startup has overcome? Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, I think kind of building really on Valeria around the point on scalability, to really understand the, the challenge that we've overcome, I just want to give you a bit of context as to what we do as a business. So we are a learning and development marketplace where we help employees access um, content from over 250 different learning and development providers. Now, pre-COVID, we were, we'd focused on working with um, UK employers um, and we had, you know, employees dotted around uh, Europe that we were supporting accessing the, the platform. Then what we saw during lockdown was, you know, people just dispersed and became remote. Uh, and so our client base, you know, we went from having employees maybe in, you know, 10, 15 countries to having over employees dotted over 70 different countries. Now that posed quite a challenge for us because as a marketplace, we have to always balance supply and demand. And so we suddenly went, you know, over overnight, I suppose, over a few months from having employees located in certain locations to them being scattered across 70 different countries. And obviously you have to balance where your suppliers are based. And so that I would say is a challenge that we're, as a marketplace, we're always trying to grapple with and, and overcome. So what we did uh, was we created what we call content regions. We ensured that, you know, people that are based in certain regions would have access to certain things um, and those that, that don't we're we're actually continuing to kind of overcome that challenge right now by introducing new features where they can access what we're calling a virtual card so they can buy content in their local markets if they don't have access to it directly through our own marketplace they can find a local supplier themselves but it still gives them access to the best learning and development content that they need so it's a very specific um challenge that we face as a business, but I suppose anyone's building a marketplace will have a similar kind of challenge when you, how do you, as you scale and picking up on Valeria's point around scalability, how do you create something that is accessible globally, uh, particularly in this day and age where if you're selling to HR companies, they will have a remote and dispersed workforce. That is a challenge I'm sure that other entrepreneurs will have to face as well. Rajib, thank you. And next up, uh, Alpesh, a founder and CEO of Intricity and Kendra Labs. Yeah, hi. I think, you know, one of the key things for us, so we're a sustainability data platform um, and we provide a sort of core cloud-based data, data as a service company. And one of the key challenges for us around the marketplace that we've solved, well, we haven't solved it, but we're getting there, is identifying product market fit early. So one of the key challenges we're seeing is how do you figure out whether what you're offering um, is going to scale for a, for a market? Um, and that's what I've tried to do early is dealing with customers, understanding the problem and figuring out our roadmap um, and getting early product market fit or early signs of product market fit to help you define your roadmap better. So that's one of the things we're getting really, really, um, we're definitely getting there. Um, and obviously on the back of that, we're getting customers. The, the other element of that then comes the value proposition. So actually being able to define the value proposition better um, as well. And that's all that's. As it always is, is an iterative process. So you're, you're trying, you know, what we're what we're doing is we we're, we're able to we're able to figure out what our, that sort of process is to keep iterating on what our value propositions for customers, uh, and that's definitely something that we are uh, keen on and continue to do um, as we as we uh, develop our our solution and deliver that to the market. Perfect. Thank you, Alpesh. And um, Fungai, I hope I, I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, you're a startup, so we'll ask you, uh, what is your biggest challenge challenge that you've overcome? Thank you so much, Adam, for having me. And hi, everyone. Yeah, so I would say the biggest challenge I've overcome as a UK startup was the regulatory area of trying to navigate uh, having the technology being approved in the UK. It is quite, they have set quite a very high standard. They did open their um, availability to new startups that were coming in the market as a response to COVID-19, but 
I think regulation is actually a barrier to market entry for a lot of people, especially in health tech. I don't know how others have found it, but I'm glad we have pers we've been persistent. And I can finally say we, we finally became an NHS approved software solution to be consumed by the National Health Service. So that was my hardest hard hurdle to date. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And we're doing really good for time today, which I like. Um, normally, we're 20 minutes over time at this point. So well done, everyone. And uh, we'll go to uh, Gabriele. Your question is, uh, what is the most interesting challenge that your startup has overcome? Yeah, hi. For us, it was, uh, it was uh, March 2020. It was a typical COVID situation. We had a term sheet on the table with, uh, with a VC, and actually all the deals fell through. So we had to put in place a lot of different things. We got a grant. We, we all put a few people on for low. We got a ready claim. And we actually had to hustle through uh, three, four months before uh, preparing our crowdfunding that was basically our seed that, that went very well. So that period was very hard. We really had to kind of scale back the team, fire half of the team. And we had to go really in survival mode. That was one of the most difficult things because we were on the track of a product market fit, already making you know a good traction and making good revenues. But that that deal, you know, in the fundraising process really uh, fell through and really was very difficult to go. And after the you know the crowdfunding campaign on Cedars was very well, we did the 200 percent you know of our target. And then after that, we went to Y Combinator, so it was a good success story. But really, that were the most challenging uh, like uh, like time of, of our company life. Okay, thank you, uh, Gabriele. And uh, guys, we do have a couple of polls which I posted, so I'm going to share the results with you now. In terms of location, 60% of you are in England, um, which is, yeah, lots of people are in the UK. That's uh, that's good to see. Um, Scotland, six people. Hello, Wales, four people. Northern Ireland, two people. And um, we're all across the world, really, in terms of uh, Europe, Americas, Asia, and Africa. Um, welcome to the one person from Oceania as well. In terms of the uh, other polls that we have, and we have more to come, attendee roles, we have a very good audience today. 54% uh, of you are founders or CXOs. 9% um, of you are investors, venture capitalists. And then we have a range of other roles. Um, in terms of the, the size of people's companies here, uh, I see two to 10 people is about 42%. So most people are from uh, small startups, but I can see uh, we also have people from big, big companies as well, uh, like uh, Google, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, and, and more. Um, now, next up is actually our um, VC and angel investor section. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to share two questions about investment. And I will say I, I'm going to share a link. And on that link, you can see all of our speakers and connect the, with them on LinkedIn if you want, if you're looking for investment or advice or something else. Um, so just to move on to that section. Our first speaker in that section will be uh, Evie Mulberry, Managing Partner of Astia Fund. And our question for everyone in this section is, given your experience, what tips do you have for UK startups and scale-ups getting funding in 2022? Thanks, Adam. And um, I think the first tip I'd share is to always be in fundraising mode, whether you've just closed your latest investment last week, have capital sitting in the bank to always just be thinking about that next injection of capital and that next fundraise, what milestones you need to hit, who to have around you, and really focus, focus on your customer. Um, at the same time, and alongside that, really focusing on building your personal brand, speaking engagements, articles, networking, so that people know who you are, but also what you stand for. And as investors, we obviously invest in the people behind the companies and not just the companies themselves. Um, also recognize that time is precious. So do take your time to diligence investors. You know, are you the right fit? Can you see yourself in the investors portfolio? We're good as investors of highlighting our portfolio on our website. So really taking a look in terms of do you fit in terms of stage, sector, the geography you're in. At Astia, do I want to see an all-male team? No. So you really use your time wisely. Uh, for those founders that traditional venture capital often overlooks, I encourage you to spend a bit more time finding those investors that don't need referrals. You don't need those warm introductions. And there are more and more of us, um, thankfully. At Astia, we have an open application and submission process, so it doesn't matter to, to us what your network looks like in terms of your success of fundraising with us. And finally, um, 
really just sell us, sell us as investors on your vision, be that storyteller, show us the opportunity, but at the same time, have the details and the financial story to back that up and how that vision can become a reality. I think, Adam, I could go on and on about your question, um, but mindful of time and that there are many people more to share their tips, but thanks for having me. Great. Thank you, Evie. And I know we're, Jono, I think you'll be the next speaker. So I'm actually going to share uh, the poll that we just did. Um, super interesting. So according to uh, all of you guys, 400 of you responded, 70% of you are looking for investment, 30% uh, of you aren't. Um, as we can see, you're all at different stages, but that's really, really interesting to see. And uh, I think in the discord forum which i've put a link to and um, we can definitely emphasize uh, access to investment over the coming weeks um now jono uh, while you're here because we're, we're running a bit early um th the same question for you what are your tips for getting investment thanks for that so so i lead the the vc uh, efforts for uh for google cloud here in europe and uh we're definitely seeing a lot of a lot of changes in the market at the moment so um, what I'm hearing from various different sessions that I've done recently with startups is that they're starting to see um, investors and maybe the investors on this call can can also uh, back, back me up here, but they're starting to see a lot more metrics early on in the in the cycle. So I noticed from the poll there, that you've got a lot of people looking for seed funding. And, you know, what I'm starting to see is because of the sort of public markets and the way they're going at the moment is a lot more scrutiny around you know user acquisition certainly earlier in the in the funding cycles and the journey um so that means you know typically a, you know a series a company would would be probably more metric driven uh with regard to versus c where you're really just betting on the founders etc so we're seeing you know some some vc firms asking for a lot more data around user acquisitions even at seed and so which is interesting so i'm interested in you know what the, the other you know the members uh, think of that so really just be a little bit sharper with the pencil around you know how how you're how you're doing with sort of users and and what your feedback you're getting and getting those customers on board early even when you're raising a seed round is, is what i'm hearing um i can't echo more what to what evie said around around like building your network early like you need to be fundraising all the time and certainly you know getting out there and meeting people target the vcs that you want to that you want to invest in your company is is an also an important thing and you can do that by networking of course either in person or via linkedin or wherever is or certainly more preferable with warm intros um if you don't know them personally uh, try avoid cold cold uh, emails and try and get you know get through to the people that you know through warm intros is always my is always my feedback but um but certainly you know what, what frustrates me as a as a person that's worked with over 3000 startups in the last 10 years is is really when you get a, a company come to you and ask you for what you know for your advice on what VC should be, you know you should be targeting. Um, I would expect you know founders uh, of credibility to actually have done some homework themselves and bring some stuff to me and ask me for introductions to specific VCs that would be uh, that would be relevant to them. Um, so definitely do your homework before start asking around about about that so i'd say they're the sort of top three things at the stage that the the poll of people are, are looking at uh, that i've seen certainly great thank you jono and our next speaker is aziv a partner at local globe thanks adam um so i'll just jump straight into it i guess broadly speaking you know the tips that i can share with founders today are actually not different for the tips I'd share with founders a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, probably 10 years ago. I think the first thing to note, and Jono briefly touched on it, I mean, I think it's it's know your audience. Um, I think there's never been more funds, angel investors, micro VCs, sources of capital on the market. Uh, and I think you need to know who you're speaking with. Um, you know, does the fund you're talking with invest in your geography? Does it invest in your category at your stage? And I think beyond that, you know, are you speaking to the right person within the fund? It's not only the fund, but it's making sure you're pinpointing and targeting the right partner within the organization. I think beyond that, it's also understanding the characteristics of the fund. You know, where are they in their deployment period? What is the return profile, the size of the fund? All of that is ultimately going to dictate whether or not they're a fit and whether or not you're a fit. 
Uh, and I think, you know, the, the last thing on that point is having a clear understanding of how much capital you really need to hit that next inflection point. That's something that VCs are going to want to know. Uh, and that inflection point is effectively what will unlock the next tranche of capital. Uh, I think once you know that, you know, there's broadly three things uh, that you kind of should be aware of and, and come prepared with. And that's one, your story as a founder and, and founding teams. I think the way we see it at Local Globe, founders are the absolute lifeblood of a business. And it's important to be able to clearly articulate why you are the right founding team to be building the business. And I think one thing I love that Ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz says is, you know, what is your own secret? Like, what have you done in the past that have led you to this point? And, you know, why do we need to believe that you are the right team to be building this? I think beyond just like team, uh, having a clear articulation of the market, uh, the size of the opportunity and where you sit alongside other players. I think, you know, it's it, it comes at no surprise uh, VCs look for companies going after very large markets, not in the hundreds of millions, but in the billions, 10 billions, hundreds of billions. So being able to really clearly articulate that is, is important. Um, and then the, the last thing, uh, as it relates to, to traction, it's something that a lot of uh, founders think a lot about. I think that kind of the seed and pre-seed stage, we often don't look at traction that much as it relates to revenue metrics and so forth. What's really important for us is founders coming in with real unique insights. Um, I think at kind of the scale-up stage, uh, being able to show signs of product market fit uh, or early signs of product market fit is important. And that really varies from kind of business to business, sector to sector. So I guess to, to conclude, you know, four things to, to kind of think about. The first thing is, you know, do your research on funds. Number two, you know, articulate why you're the right founding team to be building the business. Three, being able to articulate the market, you know, how capped or uncapped is it? And then four, being able to demonstrate you have unique insights in the space if it's pre-product market fit or, you know, signs of product market fit at the scale-up stage. Thank you, Ziv. And next up, we have Ercilia, uh, angel investor. Hi, everyone. So, look, a lot has been said before. I'm an angel investor, so I'm not really um, looking at this as a fund investor, a venture capital investor, which would be very slightly different. From my point of view, it's getting slightly harder, at least when I look at uh, startups and companies that are reaching out to me this year compared to in previous years, just because of the sheer amount of uh, opportunities out there. So although there is a structural, uh, you know, a perhaps a shift towards private credit, there is definitely a lot, a lot, a lot of people looking for capital on a global basis, and they are able to reach out and access capital globally. The, the things I would say, because of the sheer amount of sophisticated startups that are actually reaching out, the things I would suggest is, you know, I can summarize it in three P's if you wish. One is plan. So be sure you are ready and prepared and you know exactly what you want to ask. Um, you have a good business plan. You have a good fundraising strategy and plan. Secondly, is persistence. It's going to take a lot of time. Um, persistence goes hand in hand with passion. That's also about the team. The team really has to have it within themselves. And the third thing, at least for me, is purpose. And that's one of the reasons, uh, you know, one of the scheming um, selecting processes for me is what are these companies trying to achieve for the better world? That's okay. all for me. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank and you. then we have our final speaker in this section, uh, which is Ash. And Ash, where are you at the moment? I am based in San Francisco. Perfect. So what is your, um, your tip for UK startups and scale-ups getting funding this year? Well, first and foremost, focus on growth. The fundraising market has definitely turned this year, so it's definitely going to be much harder to fundraise, but it's always easy to fundraise when you're growing fast. So that means double-digit month-over-month growth for at least three months, perhaps even more right now. If you're not able to fundraise on strength, then the best places to look are your existing investors, especially if you're a scale-up. But if this is your first fundraise, then it's usually going to be people that you know or have some kind of affinity to. And then lastly, as a biased investor based in San Francisco, I see UK companies creating a US entity because that gets them access to US investors. Much easier for us to get involved out here when you have a US entity. Great, thank you, Ash. 
Kaya uh, or Jose Kaya. So uh, you're the CEO of Slidebean, and you're not you're not actually from the UK. You're from Costa Rica, based in New York. And the reason I invited you to this uh, conference is because uh, on the one hand, you have a company which helps startups um, with uh, template pitch decks. Um, you help startups in many other ways, uh, but you also have a YouTube channel with uh, how many subscribers right now? Coming up on 400k subscribers. 400k wow i think i have like 20 um but i invited you because uh slidebean is my favorite youtube channel for startups um there's a great playlist about fundraising which i'll share in a moment with people but i suppose then um i'll just introduce slidebean better you're a multi-million dollar company founded in 2014 and headquartered in new york city um can you briefly explain what you do for startups sure um uh, so we originally thought of Slidebean, or the original product was a, just a pitch deck builder, but or a presentation builder. But as we started to see how more how companies were using the product and what the needs of these companies were, the fact that they were trying to raise without the right tools or the right knowledge or the right traction, um, you know, we try to become a wider tool that kind of touches in a bunch of other things. So today, Slidebean is a bit of a suite of tools for fundraising, from an investor CRM to a financial to a financial modeling uh, generator, to uh, uh, started lessons, to expense tracking, to keeping your books in order, and kind of like a suite of things that companies will need as they approach investors. Yeah, so where did your idea of Slidebean come from, and when did you know there might be an opportunity in the market for it? This startup accelerator called Dreamit back in 2012 with my previous company. And for me, coming new to the startup world, like this was a... Dream it gave me a crash course in how everything startups operated. And I had no idea how everything startups operated, you know, from reading TechCrunch, but not on really understanding the context of how or why companies are raising money, what traction they need to have. You know, at that point, the problem that I saw was that people struggled to make good PowerPoints. That is a real problem still. But, uh, you know, related more to what we do now, I realized that there, there, there are all these people who are trying to fund a company, to raise venture capital, to live this startup world, but they don't really understand it. Um, so, you know, our content tries to solve that. And that is kind of the public slash marketing version of what we do. Uh, but we've done over 200 videos, essentially trying to bridge that gap for people. Uh, and now the product also tries to do that a bit. Okay. And uh, Kai, I know you have uh, two co-founders from 2014. Were you guys... Did you know each other for long? Did you have very different skill sets? Uh, how did it come about? Yeah, I'm, I'm, like what I think about co-founders now, uh, and, and I think we got lucky that we solved it that way back then, is that I think that the founding team needs to have the skills, the capacity to get a company to 100K in revenue uh, without needing new skills. That's th That I think is something that people don't necessarily think about when they try to find a co-founder. Maybe they'll have a... Uh, marketing co-founder where there's no no one who can build the tech or maybe they have a tech co-founder but there's no one who can sell the technology i feel that those skills should be encompassed in the founding team and the fewer people the better yes uh if you have just two people that have all that have all the operational and the logistics and the marketing and the sales and the technology skills to build and sell your product fantastic uh, but usually that's going to be two probably three people so yeah one of my co-founders i knew from pretty much all my life is he was a classmate of mine since elementary school and a good friend. And the other Jose, our CTO, we found together, but, you know, we definitely decided to do some work together before getting in bed. Like the relationship with your co-founders is, is like a marriage without the fun stuff. Uh, you're going to have to deal with a lot of very difficult conversations. You're going to have to see each other every single day. And, you know, you need to ensure that it's somebody you can trust and somebody you can, you can interact with for years. Yeah, I, I really like that. A marriage for, without the fun stuff. Um, and then my next question for you is, you set up in 2014 and you uh, had your first round in 2016. So maybe tell us about your fundraising journey. My first company went out of business because we could not raise money. And what we tried to do then was just try to raise money on our story. We had a decent story to go for. We had a, uh, we funded a Kickstarter campaign, uh, got a bunch of press. TechCrunch called our game first company, the next Angry Birds. So we had all, I think that we had a really, really powerful story. We were, we had no experience and maybe that's, I mean, probably that uh, was a, an important variable, but 
we tried everything we could to raise money in the story, even being part of Dream It, even with all the investor interest that we got, and we couldn't. So learning from my mistakes, next time I was around fundraising, I was only going to go through it, that painful, heartbreaking process that it is to pitch investors and get rejected. I was only going to go through that uh, with metrics. So you know, the round that we raised on Slidebean was once we had some revenue, once we had some decent sales, proof of concept, double digit, gro- double digit growth. And before that, we just bootstrapped our way to, to it. Great. And you've had experience with accelerators and incubators. Could you tell us more about how much benefit that was and the challenges involved? We did dream it with, or I did dream it with Potatoes, my first company. And then with Slidebean, we did uh, Startup Chile, which is kind of an accelerator, but really more like a grant like an equity-free grant from the Chilean government. Uh, this is us bootstrapping without going to pitch investors. And finally did 500 startups, which is more of a growth-based program. Like I've, I've been through more accelerators than I like to say, but again, just in this process of bootstrapping. But um, I think that they're especially valuable if you are an outsider to the startup world. Uh, if you don't have a network in a city where you intend to live or where you intend to establish your company, or if you don't have a network at all, uh, and are coming in new like me to the startup world. I think the seven, six percent that an accelerator will take is well worth to sort of fast track your way into honestly a bit of a niche little bubble of a world that it is startups. Right. And how does the fundraising experience differ? Is it harder now or easier now compared to uh, 2016 when you first started? I think that's fun. Like, I have a skewed experience fundraising because I was always an inexperienced outsider founder. Uh, like I've never raised money as an insider because, you know, our round in Slipey that we were still new to this world. I think that it would be very different now with a new network and so on. Like you know, that's why people who grow up in Silicon Valley or in New York or in, in London have access to these that, that have probably built these networks automatically without intention through their whole lives you know, are much better positioned. It feels like, and, you know, looking at the companies that we work with, it feels that earlier stage companies are having easier access to capital these days compared to what we saw. And that's just a glimpse of what I've seen kind of through the pandemic in the last year and a half or so with the companies that we work with. Right. And uh, you've actually, your, your company is quite unique because you've raised money in South America, North America, um, maybe different places. Uh, how does the experience differ between countries? That's a good question. You know, checks in South America uh, are usually smaller. Um, it's really hard, if not to say impossible, to raise a, except Brazil. Brazil is, is its own world. But it's really hard to you know, raise, say, a, series e, a large Series A or a Series B round in Latin America in general, uh, because investors usually are not writing checks that big. Uh, so that's that's kind of like the difference. I think that you know investors in Latin America are trying to catch up, to play catch up to what's going on in the States, which is very, very exciting. They started to accept terms like convertible notes and, you know, and, and seed rounds with little traction. Like that's, that you can see that much more than you used to back when we started nine years ago already. But you know, once eventually you will need to go to one of the major hubs uh, if your company's going fast. Well, thank you very much for that. And then I suppose my final question, uh, in our last event that we did for the Nordics, um, some people were talking about, instead of focusing on problem and solution, uh, focus on uh, the success so far, the demand. Uh, what do you think people uh, should change in the, their pitch decks nowadays? I think the, the part where people focus the least on the pitch deck, where they should be focusing the most, I believe is, is in the go-to-market plan. Like most decks are to grow the company. Like unless you're really, really early and you're building your first prototype, which would make you a pre-seed company that maybe maybe you shouldn't be raising money yet. Unless you're that, your deck is going to be about growth. Uh, and yes, the product is exciting and we're all, most of us founders or product people are really excited about the product. But to me, if the cash is going to mostly go to growth and expansion, like that's where the, bread and butter, butter of the deck should be. By no means it should be you know, 10 slides on go to market. You, should, you just should be really, and sometimes honestly, it's a bit of fake until you make it. Like in our case, uh, our first go to market slide was really strong. The idea there didn't work, but we were completely bullish and completely convinced that this go to market strategy was going to work. Uh, and we had tested it and we had numbers behind it. It failed and we had to change it really quickly when, when that happened. 
but the fact that you've come up with a way to get to your next milestone is is critical and just my last point on that go to market is combined with with safe financials like a lot of people raise money to last 18 months but that's not necessarily the case you should you should raise money to get to the next fundable milestone ideally that's 18 months away but sometimes the go to market has a mismatch with with that sometimes you're raising your seed round say and your go to market and your financials tell you that you're going to get to say $800,000 in ARR that's a really shitty place to be because that's not enough to raise a series a so you're probably like in this kind of middle gap in this valley of death sort of thing so like those two things are i think the biggest mistakes or the biggest errors i see a go to market or find a go to market that's really really strong and that you believe and that you can sell to investors hopefully backed up by some real numbers and making sure that the milestone that you're aiming for with this deck is what you need to grab the next branch of funding Okay, muchas gracias, Jose, uh, Kaya, uh, Pura Vida. Um, thank you from, from Dublin uh, to Costa Rica or New York. Where are you right now? I'm in, the, this is our Costa Rica studio. Oh, very cool. I, I wish I was there. Um, I think that the weather is better than Dublin. But look, uh, thank you very much. Um, I've shared a link to your, your YouTube uh, channel playlist uh, about fundraising, which I think is uh, very useful. Folks, now we're going to move on to the next speaker, uh, which is um, John Cutler, and John is a product evangelist at Amplitude. So, John, perhaps you can start by uh, explaining what Amplitude is. Yeah, Amplitude is primarily product analytics, experimentation, feature flagging. But the way I like to describe it is it's more about powering that learning loop. It's very important for teams. So it's kind of funny. I always ask teams, are you shipping faster than you learn or learning faster than you ship? And certainly when you're a startup, shipping is important. <laughs> it's important to be getting that engine going, but you actually find a lot of people, a lot of people are not learning nearly as fast as they're shipping. So that's what I tend to think our product helps uh, startups do. So we're talking today about a term called digital optimization. Uh, can you explain what that is? Because I know you guys really want to get that term out and be a popular one. Yeah, and that's a little bit what I was referring to right there. When you look at the sort of highest performing teams in the world, they have a strategy. They manifest that strategy in the models they use and how they set their goals. Um, but they do attach measurement to it. And when they prioritize, they focus where there's leverage they run experiments and then they learn. I think importantly for startups around that particular loop is, is, you know, that's sort of cliche. You could say build, measure, learn is a very like cliche phrase in a startup world. But I think what's so critical for startups is to think what truly are those underpinning assumptions that you're trying to work. And, and sometimes you do actually just need to charge ahead and fake it till you make it like Jose just said. Um, but you have to be very clear and transparent about when you're doing that. So back to digital optimization, that's largely about that kind of loop of turning strategy into priorities, into experimentation and seeing what works. Uh, for startups, it's very important to be very clear about what your operating assumptions are and then what your testable assumptions are, because sometimes you just need to charge ahead. Okay, John, uh, thank you for that. And uh, can you explain then what a digital product is and how has the category evolved in recent years? I mean, I think traditionally people think of, you know, apps and product that you access, you know, from a browser or, you know, digital product that way. I think what's very interesting that startups need to think about is, you know, I thought the other day, it's, it's another cliche phrase, every business is a technology business right now. And, and that is largely correct, but there's so many interesting angles and businesses that exist. I mean, one example is an extremely large customer of Amplitudes is Anheuser-Busch, and they're complete, they run one of the biggest B2B marketplaces for uh, bodegas in South America to buy beer. You know? So is that a digital product? Well, yes, there's an app. Yes, they're ordering stuff, but this is a logistics business. This is a sort of unsexy business. And so I encourage startups to think a little bit more broadly. You know, you tend to think, oh, we should start an app or just start this or we start that. I tend to think like, where are there inefficiencies? Where, where is there an ecosystem that you can play in? And so the definition of a digital product has changed a ton from, oh, I guess we're gonna have an app. And that still is true, of course, but it's it's a lot more interesting, I think, now as businesses just in, in essence become technology businesses. So on that point, uh, in Ireland, I see so many people setting up a business and they, they say, yeah, I'll make an app 
so they make a solution, but they have no problem for the solution, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, this is, I, I do think there is a lot of validity in knowing about a problem and solving a problem you're fairly familiar with, maybe that you'd experienced at a company in your life or something, and you are the customer. I mean, let's admit that there's many models of businesses that actually did really well doing that. I think what you, what you see a lot is people lacking the, the kind of rigor around discovery. We have someone, we actually bought a company at Amplitude called Iteratively and Patrick on that team, um, him and his co-founder spent a year talking to people, a year. These are very skilled technologists too. They could have built anything any day, <laughs> but they slowed themselves down. Also similar here in Santa Barbara, you know, the founders of GoToMyPC, these are these like traditional older you know, technology businesses, when they started this company at Folio in Santa Barbara, they spent a year living with their customers. So I think that we sort of, if you can build, the temptation is to build, 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 but have you really slowed down and figured out what's going on or build for a group, you know, and then cross your fingers and hope you can expand later. So I think there's, there's two ways to, to skin this problem. Yeah, and I, I, that's really interesting. And are there any um, other mistakes that you see uh, startups in particular make when it comes to digital products? Yeah, I think one thing related to our world and Amplitude is, um, you know, I hear VCs come to me all the time and say, how, sh how can we have standard metrics for all of our particular portfolio companies? And then I see all the portfolios come to me and say, oh my God, the, you know, the board, the investors are killing us with these standard metrics. So one thing I say to the to teams is, yes, most businesses have an array of standard kind of metrics if you're in B2B SaaS or something, there might be churn or expansion revenue. But every business has some unique metrics about the value proposition, about how is your product working the way that you expect it to work. So advice I give to startups is, Yes, you need to play a little bit of that generic metrics game, but it's really up to you. If you outsource the definition of value to your investors, they will come up with one. So you need to lead with a strong vision for what value means and how you're going to measure it. And you lead the way there. And, and most investors are actually pretty reasonable about that. They said, well, we actually have this array of generic metrics but that one's, you're measuring really, really well. You're, you know, you're using Amplitude. You link people to notebooks and dashboards for us. This works great. So if you create a vacuum, someone will fill it. So don't create a vacuum in terms of measurement and how value is defined for your product. Uh, that's my general advice. Okay, cheers, John. And we're out of time, but um, oh, yeah. we're both going to speak. I know that, that went really quickly. Um, yeah, we're both I'm going excited to, to do these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, it'll be recorded, by the way, if, if anyone um, wants to see it again. Uh, we're, we're going to host a, an event a conference in uh, July, the European yep. Digital Optimization Conference 2022. So I've put a link into that. Uh, thank you so much and yeah my um, pleasure cheers thank you from ireland yeah. good luck and... to everyone doing their thing this is <laughs> it's it's hard it will pay something something will work eventually yeah okay good talk to you soon good stuff um and next up folks uh we have another speaker samantha richardson principal visioneering consultant at twilio startups um samantha perhaps uh we can start off by uh, you telling us what twilio uh, is yeah, sure. Hi. Hello, everybody. Good to be here. So Twilio, we, well, Twilio, think of Twigo, Twilio like the building blocks. What we do is provide um, APIs to really service that communication layer of the internet, as our CEO likes to call it. And I think that that's a really good description. So you're probably using Twilio every day and you don't know it. We know this because more than 500, something like a trillion um, engagements happened through our platform last year. So therefore, you're probably using Twilio every day and just don't know. It could be something as simple as an SMS um, about a, an appointment reminder. It could be a video call. It could be some security. But what we do is really give people the building blocks to enable companies to um, build their own customer experience. And, um, you know, we've been a lot of the companies that are now kind of really mature customers for us started off as startups. And, you know, we gave um, the likes of Deliveroo, Uber, Lyft, the tools in order to build that customer experience that really changed the way we um, thought about customer experience, I would say. I'd be bold enough to say that, you know, they were real game changers and, and that was using the APIs that we provide. Yeah, no, I would say... Um... 
a big mistake startups make and maybe companies in general is they sell, 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 they sell this, they promise this, but then they deliver this. Do you think um, customer retention and actually doing a good job for the customer is sometimes overlooked? Yeah, it really is. And I think it's hard, right? As we heard one of the speakers earlier say, you know, what investors care about is growth and seeing that double digit growth and growth takes up a lot of energy and time and resources. I think the, the problem is that where you see when companies get to that kind of next level of maturity, if they haven't thought about that retention or really thought about how they iron out the creases or the problems in process that may have been created, then it starts to, it starts to cost. It starts to cost in terms of servicing and it starts to cost in terms of retention and acquisition. I read something the other day where we know that about 50% of, um, apparently the online acquisition costs have increased 50%. It's not cheaper to get, to go through digital acquisition now for customers. So I think retention becomes even more important there. Um, but, but it's hard, right? You're trying to juggle everything on a really small number of people when you're a startup. But I do think that focus on the processes, ironing out the creases that you've got, being really close to what your customers are saying, what they want, you know, it, it, that's how you start to think about retention by delivering good service. And when something does go wrong, being able to resolve it pretty, in a pretty timely manner. This is an age old problem that companies from, you know, two to 2000 still struggle with, um, but it's the key to retention. Yeah, so retention then uh, should be a focus, uh, but also we can't forget about growth. Uh, what do you think drives growth, uh, in your opinion? I mean, for us, we think we, you know, we're in this relationship economy, as we like to call it. So I think um, what drives growth, what, what we think drives growth is the relationship that you have with your customers. I think it's product and relationship. It's knowing your customer. It's being able to engage and communicate with them when they need you to communicate and engage with. It's also about having data. As you scale, it's about having that data to know who your customer is. Um, again, whether you're two or 2000, having a really understanding who your customer is, what they want, what their pain points are, what their needs are, um, I, I, I think is essential. They're the essential parts of um, growing. I, I was at an event with a great founder um, the other month and she was saying, you know, the amount of effort and attention they put into research and staying very close to their customers is perhaps more than other startups would, but they know for them it reaps benefits because that's how they're accelerating their growth through being really close all the way. Thanks. And I did a survey um, of everyone uh, attending and it seems that um, B2B startups uh, outnumber b2c startups um, by three to one uh, and that's actually common in all our all, all our events in europe uh i'll just give you a quick look at the poll here what are your most effective channels for customer engagement i mean email doesn't come out on top actually linkedin uh comes out on top and social media uh even surpasses email i mean what what do you think is the best form of uh, contacting people in b2b and in b2c over the past two years we've seen b2b and b2c behaviors merge. So actually now we've got so used to doing a lot of our conversations in business on our phones that WhatsApp has become incredibly useful in B2B as well as in B2C. So we're really seeing those lines blurred. I'm not surprised that, um, I think LinkedIn is probably indicative of, you know, the, the stage that people are at of the call that we're in. I think, yeah, social media increasingly, it, 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 that doesn't surprise me at all. I think it's incredibly, um, it's about meeting customers where they are, right? Whether you're B2B or B2C. And I think that social media is, is a great channel. WhatsApp we've seen in the last year, it has is absolutely growing because you can do so much with it in terms of automation as well as having like a longer conversation, which doesn't cost you as much as say funding a whole contact center would cost. So I none of those surprised me. And honestly, I think that email is, is overlooked. I think that we tend to think that it's really difficult and it's hard to manage. It's also cheap. You can convey a lot of information in email. It's great as a receipt. It's great for retention. I think when you're starting up, email can be a really great way to, to be communicating and engaging with your customers. So 
it, it kind of fell out of fashion a bit, but you know, I'm sticking with it. I think I think it's a, a really good solid way to start building that relationship and resolving relation, you know, resolving any queries that come up. So yeah, they 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 that poll is probably indicative of what we see. Yeah, most emails are terrible, to be honest. Like most emails um, are terrible, right? But you can do so much with them. It's just a frustration that people don't. Yeah, my my uh, my advice for anyone out there is um dear name always put the person's name in the title and at the start of the email and even if it's automated and uh, have one link and nothing more <laughs> that's uh, that's the, the main thing and, um, and make it genuinely personal and we'll probably talk a little bit about personalization because we should but you know those ones that say dear then samantha in capital letters like absolutely this is a template but you're pretending not to be a template you know, that's no good. Authenticity is really important. If you're going to spend the time, if you want your customers to read what it is you're sending them, at least do the courtesy of making it, you know, authentic. Because there's a lot of competition out there, especially if you're setting up a digital business, you know, stickiness is really important, but digital is very transactional. And there's a lot of choice out there. So if you're going to stand out, you should probably make it Personalize it, sure, but make it authentic. Okay, Samantha, thank you so much. And uh, in the chat, I'm just going to share a link to Twilio Startups program. It's thousands of uh, pounds in free resources, uh, education resources as well. So um, you can uh, apply for that for free and, uh, you know, see how it goes. So thank you, Samantha. And um, folks, obviously with Twilio uh, on Thursday next week, if you don't know, um, we're hosting a London CXO breakfast on the morning of Thursday, May 5th. And in the evening, we're hosting a uh, London Startup Meetup 2022. Um, and actually for the London Startup Meetup 2022, if you wanna be a speaker, uh, we have an application form on our website, startupnetwork.eu slash UK. Now, next up, uh, last but not least, um, we have uh, Ruth, uh, Head of People and Organizational Development uh, at Personio. Um, Ruth, can you tell us uh, a bit about yourself and Personio, please? Hi, absolutely. Hi, Adam. Nice to, to meet you and to meet everyone here. Um, yeah, so I think uh, just starting with Personio, we're an all-in-one software um, for small and medium-sized organizations based um, all over uh, Europe with our, our focus of making kind of HR as transparent, uh, efficient and automated as possible so that the organizations can really spend their time where matters their, their people and their strategy um, and really thinking about kind of maximizing that full employee life cycle and making sure that, as I said, if you're a HR leader or a founder, that you can spend the time um, where matters and that Personio picks up those core um, HR processes for you and just makes them as simple simple as possible. Um, and I head up people and org development at Personio, so thinking about how we uh, continue to invest in and retain and build uh, the talent um, that have driven the success of Personio and will continue to, to drive that as we move forward. Great. And attracting and retaining um, talent, why is this such a big topic nowadays for startups uh, in particular? Yeah, I think uh, you're right. It is, it's a major focus um, at the moment. And I think Listen, the the kind of competition for top talent, um, so to speak, is is really heating up. And I think after two years in a pandemic, people have really reevaluated what's important to them. Our personal lives, our work lives collided, and um, people are kind of now. Uh, seeing the benefits, but also demanding that level of, of flexibility, but also wanting to see personal growth and, and see themselves um, really being invested in, in the organization. So I think, you know, decision makers um, have really, you know, made great progress in this area. We think about um, organizational leaders and the amount that they're investing, but I think we've all been challenged to kind of rethink our approach and redesign a people strategy that reflects what you know our, our talent want today and, and what the future talent is going to want um, in order to continue to retain them. So I think it's the world that we're living in and, and the changes that we've all experienced recently have um, kind of, I think, made us all double down on that and, and had to really rethink the process. Yeah, and can you uh, perhaps explain a term called uh, employee strategy? Um, why is HR focusing so much on it nowadays? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm probably biased, but I think it's really simple, right? Behind every business, there's a great team and uh, making that team and that great team a reality requires a strategy. So it's it's thinking about how, how are you going to attract the talent that you need today and tomorrow? And then how do you make sure that you continue to invest in that, uh, map out what that looks like in the future and, and retain those individuals? Um, when I started my role, Hanno, our, our founder said to me, you know, give me your elevator pitch. If someone doesn't know what you do, to, you know, tell me what you do in, in a couple of words. And I said, you know, making sure that the Personio 
personios of today can take advantage of the personios of the future. And I think um, that really is your, your people strategy. Um, and so making sure that you can invest in your, your biggest asset, your most valuable asset, and that's your, your people, right? So um, yeah, I think that's why it's important. Um, it's really easy and simple to say. It's a little bit more challenging to do and making sure that you really prioritize it and take a strategic approach, um, understanding what matters to, to your employees I think ultimately means then that you, you know, your driving engagement leads to driving uh, productivity and ultimately company performance. So it's it's obviously um, from an employee perspective, um, important to feel valued um, and seen, but from a from a leader's perspective, from a founder's perspective, it drives the bottom line, right? So I think um, really, I think the more we can connect your HR strategy to your overall business strategy, that's the sweet spot. They shouldn't, they should be kind of uh, in lockstep and, and supporting each other rather than being kind of independent. Yeah, and obviously, um, this goes back to customer experience as well. Uh, retention, retention, retention uh, of employees in this case is uh, really overlooked. Um, do you have like one, two or three tips about how that can be improved? Yeah, I think it starts with understanding your organization. It's not one size fits all. So why are people joining your organization? Um, what is your current employer brand and, and what's really drawing people? So those that choose to work for you, why did they make that choice? The, the teams that you have right now, what's driving their engagement? And that's unique to each organization. Um, and then finally, what, why are people leaving? Um, and I think it goes beyond just kind of the, you know, what the initial data might tell you. Um, looking at, you know, people say, you know, people leave for salary. It's very rare that that's actually the initial driver. Um, so really understanding what matters to your people is the first step because that's, you know, your strategy is going to be built on that. And we just heard from Samantha there, the importance of data, right? So building your HR strategy in data is really, really key. And once you have that data, then I, I say definitely something that's simple and sustainable when you think about uh, what you're investing in and making sure that for those more administrative kind of um, process pieces that you can leverage the right tools and resources so that if you're a lean HR team or you might not even have a HR team just yet, that you then can spend the time supporting and retaining and developing uh, your talent um, and allow the processes to be kind of handled for you. I think the last thing, and I know we're we're tied on time, but I'm a huge advocate of feedback. Um, and so I think fostering a culture of feedback, um, particularly in those early days and kind of setting out what you want um, feedback to mean for your organization at Personio, we believe that feedback is fuel. And I think setting uh, out in the right way and making people see, um, you know, feedback can be so valuable in their development um, and it can really help the organization continue to iterate and improve if we do it at a personal level, at a team level and a company level. So I think for me, in terms of like a culture component, um, feedback is, is really, really essential. And I think if you do it early um, and you show people the benefit of it, um, it's much, much easier to get, to build momentum in that space than trying to bring that in a lot later on uh, when people maybe aren't so comfortable with, with kind of um, constructive feedback. So definitely starting that um, from the outset, if you can, I think is really beneficial. Great, Ruth. Thank you so much. And while we are with Fresonio, um, a HR software, uh, I've done uh, seven or eight questions now uh, as polls, so I'm just going to share them now. Uh, should companies post salaries in job adverts? Uh, Eighty-two percent of you say yes. Um, I do this, but I do wonder um, as my company scales. Uh, it's not all black and white, in my opinion. Sometimes uh, it's. We'll see what happens anyway. Um, is your startup more or less efficient when remote working? Most of you say it's more efficient. Uh, what is your favorite thing about remote working? Uh, reduced costs, a big thing. Uh, increased productivity. And uh, what is your least favorite thing about remote working? Um, it's really two connected things, uh, employee isolation and a lack of relationships among coworkers. And um, perhaps many of you now are returning to the office uh, five days a week, uh, two days a week. And honestly, I'm doing it and I like it, but uh, you know, it, it depends on you. Um, so that's some very interesting uh, opinions, and I can share them later in Discord. Uh, we also asked uh, some questions about recruitment, um, and I'm going to share those results now. So uh, who is involved in your recruitment process? And 92% of you say it's in-house. Um, is your HR and recruitment strategy efficient? Uh, most of you say yes. Uh, not yes a lot, but it's pretty efficient. And then uh, what is the hardest role to find a right person for right now? And uh, I see engineers are 38%. Um, so that's, uh, I guess that's no surprise um, at all. So I'm going to go on to the next section now. And we've stopped with the seven minute talks. And uh, now we're going to have uh, rapid fire talks again. Um, and Alistair, uh, if you're connected, uh, you're the CEO and founder of Digital Shadows. And uh, my question for you is, why should UK startups go to Silicon Valley, where I believe you are based right now? 
Yeah, thanks, Adam. Great to be here and good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I started out Digital Shadows in 2011 in London and we did our seed funding there, like many of you, I'm sure. Uh, 2015, I did the Series A in, in Silicon Valley and moved out. So I've been there seven long years now and did the Series B and Series C out there too, and the C1 and opened up offices in the, around the US and the world. And I think that Silicon Valley has been a really important part of that success. Um, before I, I talk about that, just a couple of caveats. One, I think you should only come when you're ready. So I, I think it's possible to build up customers and clients in the US without having to incur all the expenses of coming over and setting up offices. So really encourage people to come out first. It's just too expensive otherwise. And there's no reason why they won't buy from you now to get some momentum for the entry. And then secondly, I wouldn't advise scaling up here. It's just too expensive in all kinds of ways, but particularly hiring all the people. But why, why Silicon Valley? Why the US? US is the biggest market still for almost everybody. Silicon Valley is still your best bet as an entry point to that market. It's, it's certainly true that the funding is still here. I don't think it's anywhere better in the world. It, Silicon Valley gets written off all the time, but it is still number one by a mile. It's a fantastic spot and the best talent. If you want people that have been through this journey a bunch of times before and can really help scale and grow your business, there is still nowhere better in the world than the Silicon Valley area. Uh, proximity still matters, I, I believe. Uh, and then finally, I would say it's just a great place to live. We've got, got the weather, we've got the outdoors, we've got the food. So in conclusion, come to Silicon Valley, uh, but when the time is right for, for your business. Great. Thank you so much. And next up, we have uh, Simon Kelton. Uh, he's a serial founder. He's founded uh, a few companies, including Pepper. And uh, I want to mention, you actually uh, co-wrote uh, a movie called Eddie the Eagle, which starred Hugh Jackman. Uh, so that's, that's amazing. And my question for you again is, why go to Silicon Valley? So uh, great, great answer by Alistair. I, I agree with all that stuff. So I need, I need to take a slightly different tack on this. So in a very Californian way, having started out there on my year abroad when I was just 18, I saw Stanford and thought, wow, what a gorgeous and amazing place. So I, I managed to blag a trial for a golf scholarship there uh, and ended up actually going off to university here because it's such a magical place. So it's really all about personal de development. Uh, and the biggest thing it gives you, as Al Alistair alluded to, is energy and optimism. So in a way, you almost want to go there before you even have a startup. It's like a pre-startup place. I mean, clearly, you're going to get drawn back there when you're looking for American VC money or you want to crack the US market. But there is another side to it, which is they are endlessly optimistic, partly because of the weather and the landscape and everything. They're a very sunny, agreeable, excitable people. And it draws in those kinds of people from all around the world. And, and we do slightly suffer from the fact that we come from a bit of a nation of eels. Lots of people will put down your idea here. Lots of people might be, they might be envious or afraid or, or are annoyed that you even want to be a founder or an entrepreneur because they think you're trying to do something different or glamorous. Whereas there you are fully embraced for being an entrepreneur and a founder. They want to know what your ideas are. They want to know who you are and why you want to pursue this stuff. So. If you want to go on that crazy journey that you know might involve, in my case, films and TV with exciting people, or tech startups, or my latest, which is an adventure travel company, you know, California and Silicon Valley are amazing places to give you that shot of adrenaline. Thank you, Simon. And next up, we have uh, Russ Breckenbridge. Hi, thanks very much. Um, so nice to virtually meet everybody. It's a shame we can't all have a drink afterwards. Uh, I'm, uh, I think I'm one of the, the very few people here who's in the biotech industry. So it's a sort of a completely different kettle of fish, I think, from a, what a lot, of, a lot of people have been talking about. My background is I've actually worked uh, in, in the Bay Area as the CEO of a, a biotech called Silver Creek Pharmaceuticals, came back to Europe and then started up uh, a, uh, from, from scratch another biotech. And really, for, for our world, it's very capital intensive. And at the very earliest phases, when the um, uh, when the, when we're at the highest risk, it's all about generating the maximum amount of data per per dollar. And really, the the. The, there are huge opportunities in the Bay Area in terms of biotech, the, the population of people who want to work for you and the, the specialist centers, but it's really expensive. And on a pure sort of cash burn basis, uh, 
I, you know, we took the view that it really made more sense to be in Europe and to do the early phase things in Europe, and then later on to, uh, to, to open up some sort of US footprint, whether it's in Silicon Valley, Boston, or some of the up and coming places like Texas, we will, we will see. We're about a year away from clinic. But I think the point is, people have other, uh, other people have made the point that there is a different investor pool. Uh, there is a different uh, uh, a, a different pool of risk capital, which is something that certainly in the UK we miss. I think Simon's point about optimism and 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 sort of being not not too English is exactly the right point. And being a being a medic, I think it's all about dose. The right dose of being British is not zero percent or a hundred percent, but the same goes for being Californian. It's not a hundred percent or zero percent. And really, what I, I look on my future life as being balancing the two, uh, leash, unleashing my inner Californian, but not completely suppressing my inner Brit. Thank you very much, Ross. And um, next up, we go from Silicon Valley to uh, New York. Um, we have John, who is CEO of Hive. Thanks, Adam. So I'll speak to SaaS, which is what I know. Uh, and uh, Hive is the only democratic project management platform. So if you're bored of Asana and you want to have a voice in your own tool, uh, give us a shout. Um, the answer here is simple. Do you want to be a gladiator? Not everybody wants to be a gladiator. It's absolutely brutal. The, the risks are very high. The rewards are, are also huge. Why is entering the American market choosing to be a gladiator? because there are eight times as many SaaS companies in America as there are in the UK. You're competing against a huge number of companies and you're competing against huge ad spend because American startups spend in their own market first. Why could it be rewarding? There's a good stat here. Eight times as many competitors, 15 times as much spend as the second largest market, which is actually the UK, $108 billion last year. Uh, why is it different or how, does it, how, do, how do you experience it different day to day? American buyers warm to UK sellers. We have a good relationship, a good cultural relationship of trust. Second is watch out for which state you choose. It's not always obvious from the outside that the American separate states can be just as different as different European countries. And the last bit would be remember that you will get much, much less government support. The UK does a great job of supporting startups. So in summary, it's a terrifying thing to do. The rewards are absolutely huge. We did it, we succeeded. And for anybody who's thinking about it, get stuck in, it's worth it. Brilliant, uh, thank you, John. Next up, we have a very interesting section called uh, the five myths of raising capital. It's a panel discussion uh, with Maya, um, who's one of uh, Sifted's 100 female angel investors. Uh, we have Barbara, uh, CEO and co-founder of House of Ventures. Uh, Anita, CMO of The Factual. She's also founder and host of the European Startup Show. And finally, Claire, uh, who is founder of Claire Macmillan Pitch Coach. So I'll stop sharing that now. And um, I'll, I'll pin all the speakers, um, but welcome you. Uh, maybe uh, start by introducing yourselves. Uh, Anita, I'll, I'll pick you. Okay, great. Hi, Adam, um, and hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Yeah, my name is Anita Murthy. I am the CMO of The Factual. It's a, a media news company, a platform that uh, finds unbiased news for um, the people. Um, in addition to that, I'm also the host and founder of the European Startup Show. It's a podcast that's specifically focused on the European ecosystem and shining a light on all the incredible entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship we have in Europe. And uh, I've been really fortunate to have everybody from seed stage to really big um, unicorns in on the startup. Um, and I look forward to talking more about uh, the VC and funding. Yeah, Maya, uh, we'll go to you next. Sure. Hi, um, great to meet everyone here today. Um, I'm Maya Mufarik. I founded marketingcube.co, which is a growth consultancy. I work with um, startup and scale ups, defining and implementing their growth paths. Um, I'm very much a tech marketer through and through, started in Silicon Valley, refocused on the UK startup um, scene and you know, growing startups at different stages is a very different kind of ball game <laughs> from product market fit to, you know, taking over the world and the US as we heard just now. Um, so that's really what I love to do. And um, I spend about 20% of my time also angel investing, um, kind of in my way of 
giving back, I guess. Great. And Barbara, uh, we'll go with you next. Thank you, Adam. And uh, I am Barbara Cicello Mecalpa, and I'm the CEO and co founder of House of Ventures. We are venture builders. So we have been working for probably some of the biggest companies in the world, including Microsoft, Google, and Apple. So we have seen the miracle happen. And that kind of knowledge is the knowledge that we bring to support uh, founders in their you know, mission impossible to achieve you know, success. And uh, I find this very interesting, exciting, because it's good to be part of uh, a supporting team for people who are working hard, you know, to further their, uh, you know, vision. Great. And finally, Claire. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Claire McMillan. I am a pitch coach, well, a criminal barrister term pitch coach, recently returned to the UK, having spent a few years in Silicon Valley honing my craft, working with companies all different stages from seed through kind of series D and beyond, beyond completely sector agnostic. And I work on both the deck itself and on the storytelling, the verbal storytelling. And uh, Claire, I guess um, we will discuss the five myths of raising capital, but I'd like to actually start with you because you focus on pitches. Um, what is the difference between pitching in the UK and the US? Because most people here are looking for funding. They're going to look in the UK, but many of them also in the US. So what's important in that regard? Well, I would say that um, during the course of the time that I was in the US, which is sort of 2016 onwards, I think things have changed quite a bit in the UK. So I, I think there's now perhaps a difference in terms of investor mindset than there used to be. But I guess I would still say that there is, in terms of both, storytelling is absolutely critical. In terms of what the different audiences are looking for, I still kind of detect a greater desire for, you know, longer forecasts, um, from US investors, for, you know, further out forecast from US investors, from UK investors versus US. I guess maybe some of that comes down to some UK investors being more out of a kind of corporate finance background rather than an operational background, operators background. Perhaps that kind of influences that. And I also sense um, whether it's a greater appetite for or whether it's a greater tolerance of longer, more wordy slide decks amongst kind of UK audiences than I do in the US. My philosophy right from the very beginning, when I first started doing this, working with venture-backed businesses, I was actually in California. I first started working quite a bit with Oxford Ventures, but always out of the US, never out of the UK. And when they first gave me my first job for them in London, I remember asking the, the women concerned, like, what kind of deck am I writing? Am I writing a US deck, you know, or a London deck, you know, West Coast deck or a London deck? And she was like, absolutely a West Coast deck. We need to import best practice. That's what we need to do, which is what I did and which is what I've always done. And I definitely think that London is, or, or the UK, I should say, it is turning and is becoming, you know, similar in mindset to the US. Yeah, and what would you say, this is a big question, what is the most common mistakes that people make uh, with their pitch decks? I would say, I mean, there are loads, right? And it depends on the deck and every deck I see has got, you know, some good points and some bad points. But I suppose if I had to boil it down to two key things that I would really stress that people focus on, one is storytelling. That one, Something to get right is storytelling. I, you can't underestimate the importance of that. It really, it's super important, both in terms of uh, the deck itself um, and in terms of your verbal delivery. And in, in terms of the deck itself, something I would encourage everybody to bear in mind is that your deck needs to pass the 15 second test. By which I mean deck lands an inbox and we all do the same thing, which is we double click it, open it up and go swipe, 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 swipe from beginning to end in a first pass in about 15 seconds, because you're just desperately trying to get your head around. What does this company even do? And is the opportunity interesting to me? And if your deck doesn't pass that, then there's every likelihood it just goes straight in the bin. So number one is making sure that your deck passes the 15 second test. And that comes down to really good storytelling, really strong storytelling, you know, concise, not lots of words on the page, using their headlines to unfold the story as you go and really strong content visualization. So that'd be one thing. And the other thing that I would encourage everybody to bear in mind is to be judicious as to, uh, as to whom you solicit feedback from. Because anybody that you ask for input or feedback on your deck will give you some. Nobody says, actually, you know what? No comments, right? People feel compelled to say something, even if actually they quite like what you've got. And before you know it, you'll be twisting and turning and this way and that and altering and blah and an extra slide. And oh, but what about this? And, and you'll end up with a Frankenstein of a deck. So strong storytelling, pass the 15 second test and be careful about whose feedback you seek and how you respond to it. Yeah, I think an overlooked piece of uh 
life advice is um, don't always take other people's advice because uh, sometimes a lot of the time they're not right. And uh, actually, uh, before we go on to the five myths, um, Anita, Barbara, Maya, do you have any tips on pitch decks or pitches yeah. in general? Adam, I'd like to just share um, two things that I heard yeah. from the different entrepreneurs that I interviewed on my podcast. One was, I think, the best tip that I've ever heard. And I think this will be super helpful for everyone. And this was by Tim Sadler, CEO of Tessian. And he said to me, he said, it's important that your storytelling helps the VCs visualize what you would be like at IPO time. So think about the press release you would write if you were going to IPO, what your S1 would look like. And that's the vision you need to paint because really good VCs, like the top tier VCs have seen the Airbnbs and the Ubers of the world. And they knew what it would look, what it looked like at startup and then how it grew. So they've, they, they kind of know how to do pattern recognition. So if you could sort of paint that picture of what you would look like at scale, that's gonna benefit you a lot. And then the other thing that I heard from, um, and this came from a VC, Kieran O'Leary from Blue Yard Capital. He said the biggest mistake he sees entrepreneurs make is they overcomplicate the story. And I think it goes to what you said, Claire, which is if your story, if your story is not clear and simple, then you actually don't have clarity on what it is that you're trying to achieve. If it is clear and simple, then you have clarity on what you're trying to achieve. So keep it simple because that conveys more confidence. Okay, thank you, Anita. Is that the same uh, Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank? No, it's Kieran uh, O'Leary. Kieran um, O'Leary, okay. Yeah, I know. That's another Very thing close. to edit out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that that yeah. guy's really cool. Um, I'm sure uh, Kieran is as well. Very, very Irish name. Uh, <laughs> very Irish, <yeah. laughs> so next up, um, we actually, uh, Barbara, I'll bring this to you. So you proposed um, this uh, this topic to talk about today, um, the five myths of raising capital. I've just uh, shared it in the chat box. Um, perhaps tell us uh, what you think is um, the, the biggest one. Uh, is a great idea su supported by numbers on paper or all that's needed? Well, the first thing that I would like to say is uh, the greatest founders that we have seen are seekers of truth. They are not seekers of money. So fundamentally, what we've seen recently is that there is this explosion of ideas because effectively, instead of having companies developing products, you have founders developing products and then developing companies. So great ideas supported by numbers are not enough. I think uh, it's important to have a vision for what you're trying to achieve. But as John from Amplitude was saying, it's very important that you really made your research. So I think venture capital, but even you know, family offices or venture developers will see very quickly through you and what you're trying to achieve. And you, know, you have the visionaries, then you have the hustlers, and you have people who have no idea. So, of course, if you have no idea, you cannot build your own deck or your storytelling because you don't know what you're talking about. So I believe the great ideas. Yes, wonderful. You have a wonderful idea. But where is your market and how are your potential customers, you know, reacting to that? And what is the feedback is the thing that comes first. So, yeah is not what is all needed. You need to have a base, a customer base that thinks that that idea is great. And personally, you need to define your loyalty. The loyalty is to your own vision, to your customers, and then is to whomever is gonna give you the money. Because this is the way companies grow. This is the way you go to a market. This is the way you go global. And this is why in the US, there is an approach and an attitude that is more discipline when it comes to the respect and understanding of the customers. Great, and uh, Maya, I'll bring uh, that question on to you. Are there any myths here which really stand out to you? I think the you know the one that really you know speaks to me is really the kind of no means more talking, and I think I've I've also you know as I grew in my own angel investment journey, which is only a couple of years old. 
um, it's really important to give a very quick yes or a very quick no. And I think that's that's partially, you know, what you know when people come to me with advice with raising money. Um, and you heard, we heard already a lot of great advice that I won't repeat around, you know, selecting your investors, you know, talking to the right people, et cetera. But I think honestly, if people are not giving you a quick no or a quick yes, like there's no point of chasing, to be honest. I think, you know, you need to be one good investors are respectful of your time and you don't want people that are not respectful of your time on your board. So you that already don't want them in. And then it's just, you know, that's that's just I think the one of the of the ethics rule or you know um politeness rule of investments these days that you have to be respectful of that time and you have to give was it no or yes and 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 no with feedback and and recommendations not because it's no from that specific person and and fundraising is hard and it's super long um and i think evie at astia was saying you should always be in fundraising mode absolutely because you actually if you're doing really well people will come and find you before you even are ready to take money sometimes so so that's um, a really important one. Um, the other thing, I guess, in the in in the myths for me, um, is that valuation does matter, <laughs> and especially as an angel investor, when I look at decks, and you know, um, some angel investment investors only look to a hundred x. You know, I often get on our kind of angel investment forums, like, but do you think this could be a hundred x? You know, could they do a hundred x? And I'm like, well, you know, some people will invest in a hundred x, some others. No, some others will make 100x, some others no, but depending on the perspective of people, they will look very closely at your initial valuation, right? Because that will really determine um, what 100x really means, the opportunity of 100x, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so, so that's really important, I think, in, um, in my mind. And uh, we touched on it before, but never to forget that part of fundraising, especially in the early stages and from your... your um, surveys today it sounds like a lot of people hearing this today are in the early stages of their um journey or raising early you know pre-seed seed etc type of rounds a lot of those investments and those obviously the kind of deals that i look at as an angel investor a lot of them you're investing in the idea of course if you have empathy in the idea if you think it's worthwhile investing in if it's worthwhile solving if there's a market for it etc but foremost you're investing into the founding team and the people around the table and their credibility to solving that so you know it's not essential but founder product fit right like are you solving a problem you know really well are you trying to change the world in in some way that has specifically been you know um, not working for you is also important and your credibility and I think uh, it was Ziv who mentioned you know what led you to this point, right? And so it's very much like why you are the right person for solving this. Um, and I'll bring up one example. A bunch of xmade.com guys um, started uh, um, uh, one of my angel investments. I've invested in them, a secondhand um, kind of curated marketplace um, for furniture in Germany. I mean, you imagine how complicated it is to ship furniture, to check for quality of that furniture, et cetera, right? Like curated marketplace. So they, they check the goods and then ship it on to those who buy them. Uh, well, but who else than the guys who made made.com to solve for that next massive challenge in furniture, right? So there's also those ways of explaining what, what is your unfair competitive advantage that makes you the only person worth betting on to solve that problem or make the world a better place in that, in that space? And I'll conclude on that. Yeah, well, one question. Um, I, I talked to some startup founders across uh, Europe and uh, obviously venture, well, obviously for me, venture capital firms tend to focus on already established uh, companies uh, in scale up stage. Angel, angel investors tend to focus on smaller companies. Um, and yet I, I see a lot of um, early stage companies go straight to venture capital firms. Am, am I right in saying that they should focus on angel investors more or do are there a lot of VCs out there which do focus on early stage? I mean, you know, I I myself go as an angel investor sometimes in parallel with a, with an early stage VC, right? There are early stage VCs that are seed and pre-seed and who will give you money on the back of just even a deck. Now, the question usually to founders is, 
is that really the right time for you to raise money from who what does that mean for your ownership of your business for the for how much equity you're giving at which discount is there an opportunity for you to do a bit more of that journey bootstrap it you know find family money find angel investments funny and most of family i appreciate you know it's not everyone can can do that but in your network are there people who are ready to bet on you and give you some angel money to allow you to then when you raise really do that um, in a slightly more beneficial way for yourself right so i think that's one to consider um absolutely yeah. well thank you and um I I see something here. It takes only two or three months to raise money. Um, Anita, Barbara, Claire, do you have any thoughts on on that? Uh, is that how long it takes? Well, I would say you should always operate under a worst case scenario. So there have been cases where you go out one month, you know the right people, you are in the right industry when it comes to venture capital, or you you know you're just it's the right moment. Or I would say operate under the assumption that it's between six months and 18 if it's a drama, but also you need to have a plan. And this is why everyone was saying you always have to be in uh, uh, raising capital mode because it never stops. You need to start before you, before you start. What I mean is, you know, many people said you should be seen, known, you need to go and have talks. The reality is people by people. So if people don't know who you are, what you do, and they cannot gather that information either in person or th through some other tools, how do they form an opinion around your product, but even you, your vision and your ability to deliver? So there have been instances where money and a lot of money has been found very easily. And I can tell you there are at the moment, you know, uh, um, industries like crypto is going like, you know, candies. You go in with a crypto project, you're going to get the money. It's more difficult for nicer things like biotechnology sometimes or med medical devices. But, you know, there is a hardware element sometimes that must be considered. So long story short, there are cases where it's really easy. But as a founder, the best advice that I could give is go on under a worst case scenario and have a plan B in case the capital doesn't come in. It's the best because, you know, pressure when you come in and you don't have the funding, start eating at your plan, at your vision, at your team. So even when you have not even started, if you really want to go and raise capital, it has to be with you since the start at the outset, and it's going to be with you for a long time. Great. And uh, Anita, um, yeah. if I could yeah. ask you, uh, where should somebody um, look uh, for funding? Where's the first place yeah. to go? Awesome. Awesome question, Adam. Thank you. So again, I want to like, you know, just listening to the entrepreneurs, I see a pattern in some of the, the answers I get. And some of them just really struck, like stuck to me. So one is um, this one entrepreneur, John um, Evald, he, he has this garden IO is there his startup. I want to give everybody credit uh, who gave me these ideas. But he said something really interesting. First of all, he raised a million dollars. That was his seed funding. And I said, wow, John, how did you do that? One, he was a serial, like it was a second startup. So he's known to your point, Barbara, he already had a track record. But the second thing he said is, he said, you know, a lot of startup founders go to all these networking events, accelerator events, these are great. But remember that at these events, you have hundreds of entrepreneurs all wanting to talk to the five to six investors that are there. So he said he actually spent more of his time getting warm introductions through people that knew him and knew his track record. And he found that reduced the cycle, reduced the sort of the financing times. So I thought that was really interesting. So, you know, basically founders, in addition to the networking events, which are good to go, try and get these warm intros. The second thing he said, which, I mean, not him, this is from um, some of the other entrepreneurs that I heard over and over again was, when it comes to VCs, Actually, all the VCs have a thesis. They have an investment thesis. They have been thinking about some problems for a very long time. And if you can go to one of these VCs that has been thinking about your problem space for a long time, you're going to have a much more productive conversation versus going to a VC that just hasn't got any experience or hasn't thought about your problem. And you're going to spend all the cycle time and you're anyway going to get a no. So that's another important thing is to understand 
that a lot of VCs have been thinking about certain problem spaces. And so if you can find those VCs that are thinking about your problem space, you're gonna reduce the time. And then the third thing is, I heard this from, again, experienced entrepreneurs, those that have done two, three startups, they, like what Barbara just said, bootstrapped it for a very long time. Because the truth is, VCs are a scaling function. They're not the people that are gonna help you experiment your ideas. So as, if you can do the beginning stages where you're experimenting and trying to get product market fit with other types of money, go to VCs when you're ready to scale. That seems to be the one that's worked. The people that had like this one person, Jonathan um, Cherokee of Content Square went, had only 400,000 for the first four years. That was his funding. And then he went from that to 40 million to 200 million right? Like he's, because he was ready to scale. And so it was really easy to get that VC money. And in terms of timing, I've heard like everything from one month to close, from beginning to end, close. But these are people that have shown the plan, shown the execution and are ready to scale. It just makes it easy. So hopefully that was helpful. Very helpful. And uh, yeah, we're on time. Uh, I love you guys. I love all the speakers in this event. Uh, best timed event ever. So uh, thank you. And next up, uh, we have our final section, and it will be with uh, Naomi, who is uh, President North America of uh, InTouch Networks. So, Naomi, I will have a chat with you now. Hi, Adam. Thank Hello. you for inviting me to join you. Thank you. I've been listening to some uh, really impressive speakers, so thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, your company then is originally from Manchester, and uh, it's launched in uh, the USA. Where and with how many employees, can I ask? Yeah, so we launched in 2018 in the United States. Um, we The business had actually been around since 2013. Um, uh, we came here, and we'll talk a little bit more later about why and everything, but um, we uh, realized that this was a huge market. We realized that there was a huge opportunity for us to expand. And essentially, we land, let's say we landed physically here in December of 2018. And by sort of the beginning of March of 2019, um, we had a team of people and, uh, you know, opened up the doors essentially um, in the United States. Yeah, so you're a global coaching and development network for elite uh, business professionals, uh, as you said, set up in uh, 2013. So is this the first time that you guys have gone international or is the US the first market? Yes, it was the first time we went international. You know, my my advice for the startups that might be listening here today who are thinking, you know, where do I go and which markets do I go to? We, we actually explored the United States and other markets quite heavily before we decided to, to physically move here and, and make that investment because it is, it is a very large investment um, and it's a risk essentially too. So as a business, we started selling, uh, we do a lot of sales over the phone and, and through e-commerce. So we'd already started selling into the United States. So we sort of knew that this was an opportunity for us um, and we were excited about it. But um, you never really know until you get here. Um, and so it is a large investment. But for anyone listening, I would strongly recommend that you sell from abroad um, and you tailor. We'll talk about this as well, but really tailoring products and services for the local market, which is incredibly important. Yeah, so in my first webinars, I was always talking about Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, but uh, we've all obviously had John in New York, uh, you're in Chicago, so it's not all Silicon Valley. Um, why did uh, you pick uh, Chicago, may I ask? Yeah, so our headquarters are in Manchester, which is also not a yeah. typical um, location for startups in the UK. Um, we uh, did a, a, an assessment of all the different cities in the United States, and we landed on Chicago for a few reasons. And this is incredibly important for people also who are thinking of moving not just abroad to the United States, but anywhere. Um, we created like a matrix which showed all the different parts of the business that we needed to work with and what we needed to do to be successful. And then we looked at different cities that might match. So for example, set up um, an office at Back in 2018, we were very much in line with building offices. We're not so much anymore, but um, we were very, very concerned about where we were going to be physically because we knew that that would have an impact. We wanted to be in a big city. New York is incredibly expensive. 
Um, I spent 14 years in New York. I love New York, um, but it is expensive to build a company for the first time. So one of the first things we thought about was, is there a big city out there in the United States that is going to allow us to have the right opportunities um, to find clients, but also the right opportunities to find employees and the right staff, right? Because again, if you go to somewhere that's very remote, um, you will struggle to find the right people for your business. Um, obviously, things have you know continued to change, and we have more and more remote workers. So those problems have kind of gone away. But I would be thinking about hubs. You know, the United States is so large. There, I mean, like the UK, where you have a hub for tech and you have a hub for different types of industries. This is now sort of it, multiply that by a hundred, right? In the United States, so your media, your finance, your tech. You, you might be in New York. Um, we're in the coaching the career development business. We help senior professionals um, with their career transitions. Um, this didn't really fit in with the New York uh, uh, industry. So we felt like somewhere we needed to go somewhere else. Now we did look at the West Coast. What you also need to consider is if you are a headquartered company in the UK, you will need to be speaking to your team daily. Five hours difference is a big deal. Six hours difference Believe it or not, that one hour makes a lot of difference when communicating with your teams. Seven or eight hours, it just wasn't going to be possible. So we felt like Chicago was the right fit. It wasn't as expensive as New York. It had the really great talent there. Um, you know, taxes and everything else. Don't forget taxes in different states, uh, you know, are, are different too. Um, laws are even different in different states. So you need to check those out. And I would probably recommend speaking to a consultant or someone who's been there and done it before. Um, but then we also realized that we didn't want to be too far away from the UK. Um, and so that was a major piece and a major element. Um, just a funny story, though, we did um, before we launched, um, we looked up uh, flights from Manchester to Chicago and they were direct flights. And then those flights were moved and changed. And then we had no direct flight to Chicago. Um, so people had to land and go through New York and other places, which again, that's it's frustrating when you want to go, you know, if you have to be in another country quickly for a quick meeting, um, you know, you need to look at the flight paths. I mean, it's something really simple as that, but we did we did consider it as well. Yeah, and um, what I find uh, quite unique about you guys is you, I think you kicked off in uh, Chicago with 18 different employees in one go. Is that correct or was it more gradual? Yeah, so we had 18, I think after a few months, we started with about 12 and we had people that were supporting us as coaches and people who were doing some of the consulting work for us. So yes, we, we did open up with a pretty large team. You know, you've got to remember that the people that come in the door, the first people that come in, um, I, I sort of uh, liken them to adventurers, right? They have to be a certain personality type to want to do something for the first time. But we had a fantastic team. Um, you don't expect that team to be there in three, five years time. The team's going to change up. You're going to move. And as a business, you're going to change too, I'm sure. So really think about who's right for the start. Um, and then as you grow and as you move, or if you don't grow and you stay the same, you may want to look at, you know, changing, you know, changing the style or changing the types of people so that it matches the the way the business is moving so yeah we did and and you know i, I recommend um one of the the biggest things i'm actually half american half british so and i had already been in the united states i i wasn't with in touch um before we launched the chicago office but um i would recommend um, getting local knowledge and having local people. Um, we did bring people over from Manchester. We wanted to continue to bring in the culture. We wanted to continue to bring in the knowledge and the training, right? We wanted that. We wanted it on, on hand. But we, we brought in local people to sell a lot of what we were doing and to, and to, to move it forward. Marketing had to be local too, um, just because the market is so different. So, so make sure you don't bring too many people over it's got to be the right number and it's got to be the right people too that are willing to um to, to relocate so there's a there's a lot involved with with staffing yes yeah what's interesting is that you've been in new york and florida and now chicago um so first of all what's the difference some differences between business between the uk and the usa but also in the usa between different states 
Yeah, the, the, the one message I, I hope everybody here um, hears really loud and clear is that we, you know, we, we all speak English, um, right? And the Irish as well, we're all speaking the same language, but the cultures are very different. Um, and even over time, the United States has really moved and, and, and created its own culture and has its own history. And we no longer can treat it as one, right? A, a product that works well in the UK and may not work um, in the United States. And you have to make a lot of changes. Um, so um, one of the biggest things that, that I have always done, and I've actually um, helped an Israeli firm that came to the United States as well, the, the one takeaway is do not expect them or do not expect your products and services to be delivered and to work in exactly the same way as they have before. Um, you're going to make modifications, whether it's the marketing materials, the language that's used, the approach, the sales approach may or may not work. So I would strongly recommend people try things out, you know, try it. If it doesn't work, pull it. Um, and if it does work, push it. Um, in terms of the different states, the United States is huge um, and the the culture and the approach that you have in perhaps nor um, New York will be very different from Chicago. And I even say if you bring a New Yorker into and any Americans who are listening to me will, will agree, bring a New Yorker into a meeting in Texas or in Chicago, you're also going to have a, a, a different response. So you've got to be very aware that um, you know sometimes you'll need a local um, to deliver a product or service or to sell it. Um, these are in extreme cases, but I've seen it. I've seen it happen. So I would say yes, they are very different, um, and they have a cult, uh, the way they do business is different. Um, but generally, products can work across the entire country, right? You don't have to necessarily modify the product, but the sales approach, the marketing approach you might have to do something a little different. So that I would just keep that in mind as well. Yeah, I've seen it with my sales. I've had sales jobs before and um, calling people in the US is just so different to in Europe. Um, and then I suppose we can finish on a couple of things. Uh, you specialize, part of what you specialize in is putting the right board members in company boards. Uh, so what do you think makes What's the benefit for a startup or a scale up of having uh, really good board members and um, what do you think are the right values they should have? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm really passionate about um, not just encouraging people to join boards, but to um, encourage startups to um, think about an advisory board and building advisory boards. I, I think they're crucial to helping startups uh, really shape the vision and to think about you know, any risks and, and to mitigate risk along the way. Um, so I'm a big proponent of it. Um, for startups that are thinking about an advisory board, you have to remember that it, it is something you have to manage. You know, they're not just going to manage themselves. Um, and so you need to be very careful about who you pick, who you choose, the right, um, the right expertise, the right connections, possibly even as well. And, and bring people in who are complementary to you. Um, if you have a very strong tech background, but very little marketing expertise, try to balance yourself out with perhaps somebody who has that marketing and PR background. Um, I would say also you have to use them for relationships, for opening doors. Again, you're the founder, you've had the great ideas, but you may not know everybody that you need to know. So bring in people who can help open those doors and make those introductions. That's essential. Um, and also, you know, I, I mentioned this, Adam, if anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn and ask any questions, I'm always happy to talk about this topic. Like I said, it's very near and dear to my heart. And I've actually, I sit on an advisory board of a startup at the moment. Um, and it's a wonderful experience if you want to be a board director. But I think for startups, you really need to take time to think about your vision and strategy for the year and then build the board out in, in a certain way that will help you. So yes, it has to be well thought through. Through, um, and then you've got to make them work, right? You've got to make them work for their time. And if you give them a little bit of equity, or you might be able to give them a little bit of pay, um, then, um, you know, it, it, it's really about making sure that you follow up and um, you make sure that they're delivering uh, on their promises as well. Brilliant. And final question of the conference uh, goes to you, Naomi. Um, what is the importance of diversity in boards? 
Yeah, so um, I've been working on with, with the board space um, in, in various different roles um, for over 20 years now. And so I've seen a lot of an evolution happen across boards. I think we've seen that accelerated in the last two to three years. And I think it's a very, um, uh, uh, it's a very positive move in the right direction. Um, I think that we can all agree that when you put a team together, um, it's important to have everyone who has a different perspective or everyone who brings their own expertise. Can't have a room full of people with the same expertise. You all arrive at the same answer, um, right? So it's really important. And I think that businesses are now um, not just under pressure, but they're seeing the results of having diverse teams and teams that come together uh, you know, with different ideas and different opinions and actually help to shape the business in a much more broad way and in a, in a way that consumers um, are more uh, attracted to. So I think it has that positive impact. But I think in general, um, we still have a long way to go. And I think there is still um, a lot of opportunities out there, especially for um, women and minorities who might be considering joining boards and considering going down that pathway. And again, I, I really enjoy motivating people and inspiring them to consider board service. Um, and I think startups are actually a wonderful place to go and get experience because um, they, they are generally, you know, pretty diverse in terms of how they're set up. I mean, you can have people all around the world, right, working on a startup together. And I've seen that happening. Um, there's, a, there's a few that we work with here in the United States. And um, there's somebody in India and there's somebody in Europe who's also the founder, right? So you don't need to be in the same room together um, in order to set up these, these organizations. So I, I feel like naturally it is, it is happening more and more. But like I said, we've still got a little way to go. And, um, you know, if anyone's listening and considering board service, that would be my message. Definitely take it on. Definitely help startups out if you have that experience and you feel like you can give back. Um, and then for the startups, you know, really think about that diverse um, complementary skill set. Um, what is it that you need and who represents your consumer base, right? And make sure um, you have the right, good, strong team that is supporting you. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's actually really, really important, uh, bringing people from your consumer base onto the board. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're not if you're not hearing from the individuals and, and obviously people who've built businesses and, and who can provide you with the strategic direction, but also giving you some sort of vision as to what it looks like. Yeah, definitely. Good stuff. Well, thank you, Naomi, for your time. And thanks to everyone as well who came today. We still have over 300 people connected after two hours. So I'm very, very, very grateful to you all. I want to say thanks to all of our speakers uh, who came here today. I want to say thanks to everyone who attended. And in terms of next steps, as you know, um, we'll be in London next week. We'll do a CXO breakfast. We'll do a London startup meetup. And uh, we also have the Discord group. Um, the Discord group right now, it's just conversation, but um, honestly, over the next few weeks, I'm developing a lot of partnerships, and I think it could be the place to go for advice uh, for your startup in Europe. So fingers crossed. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, this video was recorded, and we'll publish it probably in two weeks' time. Uh, thank you very much, and see you in London if you're there.